We're from the Mindfulness Initiative, which is a charity and a, and a think tank. We've been working with politicians since early 2014. Um, they've had a mindfulness training program there since 2013, so coming into its, into its sixth year now, where over 200 politicians have, um, have been on an eight-week mindfulness course, at least, at least part of it. So an all-party parliamentary group is a little bit like a... Um, like a, a student society for backbench MPs. There's, there's like literally hundreds of them uh, and all kinds of different things. Some are more active than others. And actually, the mindfulness uh, APPG is, is thought to be like a really kind of vibrant, interesting um, and uh, yeah, sort of productive forum for, for discussion, for inquiry, uh, for, um, uh, for all, a kind of club, actually, the politicians coming together who have a, a practice in common. It's one of the few things in Parliament where people like come together to do something that isn't about sort of you know econometric policy language or debate and is um, a, a shared a shared uh, a practice um, a well-being practice and you know, uh, for some of them. So uh, the all-party parliamentary group inquiry in 2014 2015 looked at particularly the application of mindfulness training. Uh, mindfulness-based interventions uh, in health, in education, in the criminal justice system, and in the workplace. And it was primarily looking at uh, interventions for uh, the benefit of individuals. So particularly looking, for instance, at mindfulness-based cognitive therapy for recurrent depression, which has been available on the National Health Service uh, theoretically since 2004, but in, in many areas it's, it's, it's not available. Um, and uh, the only option, if you ha have been depressed before three times or more, um, to stay well uh, is often antidepressants. Um, and so uh, the parliamentary group, for instance, made recommendations that uh, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy te uh, tra trainers, teachers, should be trained up on a national basis, and it should be part of the uh, uh, national um, psychological therapies program, and that has been acted upon in the last in the last two or three years. So, it's so an example of um, where these kind of parliamentary forums can actually have an impact um, in in public policy. Uh, what's happened now in the last uh, two or three years is that where we started out inquiring into how mindfulness could be helpful for individual students or teachers or um, people in uh, sort of patients in, in, in the NHS, it started to become a conversation about how mindfulness might not just be an intervention for a specific issue, but might instead, or as, as well, be a more sort of foundational capacity that could be helpful for the flourishing of communities, uh, the society more broadly. And in fact, um, in the words of one politician, potentially the functioning of democracy itself helping through potentially its, its self-regulation benefits, people to be um, more able to engage with those around them in a pro-social way, engage with their community, engage with the, the state as active citizens. That's one hope. So that it moved from individual benefits to the benefits in the whole, and then the same kind of thing has happened in Parliament. So in the words of one member of the House of Lords, Baroness Ruth Lister, she said, we talk about mindfulness being helpful out there, but what about how mindfulness can be helpful in here? In, in, in what about mindful politics um, more broadly? And so um, many of these uh, politicians who have been practicing mindfulness now for, for five or six years are starting to think about how it might be helpful for the political process itself, how decision making might be better, how politicians in different political parties may be able to disagree better with each other, to have a bit more perspective on their own beliefs and ideas and not take it all so, so personally. <laughs> so, uh, so this is um, what we have then um, uh, moved to as a, as a policy institute looking at. And Dan's been, been on board for a few months doing a piece of research and is now, now writing up um, a, a discussion paper that he's going to tell you about, which is that movement from individual benefits to benefits as a whole, how mindfulness, uh, sort of irrespective of how you develop it, how you cultivate it through a training program, how the capacity of heart and mind uh, could be... Um, yeah, fundamental for, for, for meeting the converging crises of the 21st century. So I'll hand over to Dan, I'll sort of come back in to help with questions, but um, really he's been doing the heavy lifting here, so um, he'll uh, continue to do so. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat>
Thank you, uh, Jamie and, and Tessa for such a, and Ulrich as well, for such a warm welcome. So, um, yeah, I guess the stage is set to, um, to, to talk about this pretty big topic then. Um, today, as Jamie mentioned, there's increasing traction, increasing interest in mindfulness in sort of broadly public policy um, settings. And it's in that context that I thought I'd like to talk a bit about this idea of thinking about mindfulness a little bit more as something like a foundational human capacity to support a flourishing society. Um, and as Jamie mentioned, we'll have a paper, um, a discussion paper on this uh, coming out in the new year. Um, so to begin, as often needs must in, in, in these things with a, a definition, I mean, the definition of mindfulness in kind of contemporary, largely secular context that we're working with here is paying attention to what's happening in the present moment in mind, body and external environment with an attitude of openness and curiosity and care. So mindfulness here points to something really very basic. And as so many practitioners of mindfulness will point out, it does have this potential to, um, to, to, to really shape who we become as people. And so our discussion paper and the points I'll be making today are particularly targeted, if you like, at political leaders and policymakers and others broadly in the space of public policy or who otherwise are tasked with articulating a vision for a flourishing society. What does that look like and how do we get there? And, you know, at this time in particular, this is so pressing, I think, if we reflect on um, how much division there is, uh, how how much information overload we all experience, um, and policymakers as well, but all of us, and how many really fundamental challenges as societies we're facing in coming decades, whether it's relating to uh, critical thresholds regarding environmental sustainability through to um, artificial intelligence and other technological breakthroughs which could be set to really transform how we work and how we live in quite fundamental ways. So in that very broad context, um, one of the main points in our paper is there is a strong case for thinking about mindfulness absolutely um, in terms of uh, specific solutions, if you like, to, pol to, to particular policy issues, but also more broadly as this foundational capacity. And of course, this is a point which um, so many popular books um, and resources on mindfulness will make. Um, it's more that what we're doing here is tailoring some of the most pertinent ideas there, in particular to political leaders and others tasked with thinking about what is a flourishing society, who may have passing understanding of mindfulness, um, but you know, where they see it to have benefits, they may well assume that those benefits accrue primarily to the individual. And to that audience then, um, you know, we suggest that mindfulness is foundational in the sense that it connects us to our deeper values and intentions as individuals. And at the same time, it speaks to the common ground that we all share um, through the very basic experience of being human. So let me unpack uh, the ways in which cultivating mindfulness, I think, can support a flourishing society. And I'll speak a bit later about some of the more explicitly pro-social outcomes, if you like, that we might think mindfulness could perhaps bring us. But to begin with, I want to say um, three fairly basic points about what's going on when we practice mindfulness, what mindfulness is, which could support us to make wiser decisions, wiser choices um, in our lives as individuals, but also in the context of the wider society that we're part of. And so the first point to make there is that, to simply note that intentionally paying attention to what's going on in the present moment, doing so on purpose, is in itself quite significant. I think it always is significant to do that, but maybe particularly at this time when, uh, you know, with our smartphones and various other uh, distractions, wherever we are and whatever we're doing, um, it's never been easier to be doing something and for our mind to be somewhere else. 
And so people often talk and write about how often we're living effectively in autopilot mode. Um, and, you know, if at, at a societal level, if we're living on that autopilot mode, more of us, more and more of the time, I think there are real social um, implications of that, and they may speak to our connection with one another, our empathy, or um, maybe our intimacy, and many other things. And, you know, to counter that, of course, we can um, learn to use technologies in a healthier way. We might block our own access to certain apps on our phone at certain times and so on, and that's really important. But I guess in that debate, just recognizing that nurturing our ability to pay attention on purpose, to choose what we pay attention to and how we pay attention, I think speaks to the more fundamental um, level of this issue of our lived experience. So in a sense, you could think that mindfulness then helps us to live our lives on purpose. And that seems in itself really important. The second thing linking mindfulness to wiser choices in a, again, very general sense, is the way that, for instance, really simple mindfulness exercises, such as just taking a moment as we just did, or even just in the space of one or two breaths, to recenter ourselves around, uh, you know, the sensation of the breath, say, and what's going on there in that moment. This can be really helpful for us to gain clarity on what really matters for us in this moment. So it can help to connect us to our deeper values, to our intentions, compared to a state where we're not fully present and maybe on autopilot mode. And there's a tendency there to, um, whether it's fairly passively consume information or maybe get very caught up in, in the mind's thoughts and so on. And instead of that, through mindfulness, we can um, connect to our values, not necessarily through thinking about them, although we, we might do, but just through the practice of being fully present, being embodied. Um, we discuss in our paper a few mindfulness um, training programs which explicitly link mindfulness practice with uh, an inquiry, an experiential inquiry into one's values and also noticing where one's actions maybe you know, align or don't align with, our, with, our, with one's values. Um, but thinking about this for society as a whole, I guess the point is that even if people hold really different values, which, as we know, they do, um, that people will connect to those values, that they will take the time and find the way to connect to their values, as opposed to living life more, so, more in the autopilot mindset that I discussed. This, again, seems pretty crucial and pretty important in the context of what is our vision for how society could flourish. And then the third thing here at a very basic level is the potential for mindfulness to widen our perspective. So when I cultivate the capacity to be mindful, I train myself to attend to thoughts and feelings as mental events. Uh, it's sometimes called metacognition. Um, I will notice thoughts and feelings which come and go in the mind, um, but maybe not get too caught up in those. And as well as this metacognition, uh, psychologists also note the, um, the ways in which mindfulness can help us cultivate what they call cognitive flexibility, which is the way to direct our attention in different ways. So for instance, it could be that we pay attention in a very focused way on something that we're working on, but then we switch to maybe a more open monitoring of our wider environment. And it's the ability then to switch between these quite different modes of awareness um, as we feel we wish to and as the situation calls for. And that's a particular skill and capacity. And the idea then is that um, both metacognition and cognitive flexibility can help us get a wider perspective on things. It's a term, this idea of perspective and widening our perspective, which comes up so much in qualitative feedback um, of participants who've been on mindfulness-based programs, including uh, the one in Parliament that Jamie and Tessa noted. And uh, so, for instance, Lord Howarth of Newport, a former minister, has described how his mindfulness practice has supported not only my focus, but my perspective, sense of proportion and balance. <laughs>
So these three things, paying attention on purpose, connecting to our values, and gaining a wider perspective on things, they represent some of the ways in which uh, mindfulness can help us to engage in our lives that works for us as individuals, but I think with important implications for society as a whole. And I'll say now a little bit more specifically on um, you know, what's the potential for mindfulness to have uh, pro-social consequences. And I think we can see this most directly in terms of the subtle but really consequential level of our attitudes and our dispositions. So, for instance, we can think about the very social dimension of simply becoming more attentive and becoming less reactive in our day-to-day -day lives. And so often when we cause harm for others, um, to others, uh, if I snap out, if um, I show my frustration, or perhaps simply if I ignore someone because my mind's somewhere else, in many of these instances, it's because I'm reactive that this harm uh, takes place. And in contrast then, if we can cultivate an open awareness to whatever's going on, it allows us to step outside of this uh, habitual um, pattern of reactivity that we so often fall into. And that can have really positive pro-social implications. So, you know, if someone says something to me which triggers a, re a reaction, um, instead of reacting from a place of maybe frustration or anger, if I take a moment just to center myself and just observe what's going on in the mind, what's going on with emotions, maybe where do I feel those in the body? Um, that opens up this space between stimulus and response that allows for a, a certainly a more considered and more creative response rather than um, a trigger reaction. This is talked about you know, a great deal, pretty much any, anyone who's um, engaged with mindfulness personally and, and written about it. But although it's a simple point, I think it does need stay, uh, stating clearly again in the context of public policy making and mindfulness as a foundational capacity, the idea being that if we can all become even just slightly less reactive in our everyday lives, then there is a potential to co-create a very different world there, um, that we could reduce, perhaps markedly, the sum total of low-level harm, if you like, that ripples out every time that we do react in a thoughtless manner. So there's becoming more attentive, there's becoming less reactive, and there's also the potential for mindfulness to cultivate greater empathy. And there's a few studies pointing to a significant relationship here between mindfulness and empathy. And, and some other studies um, uh, present evidence which is a little bit more mixed. Certainly more um, research in this area, I think, is needed. But where there does seem to be evidence, I think, is in particular uh, mindfulness in helping us just to see others' perspectives, just to see other points of view than our own. That alone, I think. Is, um, is quite an important thing. And again, that's a point which is reflected from uh, MPs, to go back to that example, um, in the Mindfulness in Parliament programme. So Tim Loughton, uh, former education minister, for instance, has talked about um, the rather more considered approach to exchanges of differing views among MPs who've been through the Mindfulness programme. And others also talk of mindfulness as effectively an antidote to what they see as the very adversarial uh, setting, which is Westminster politics. Now, as well as evidence linking mindfulness to these social capacities, um, our paper also looks a bit at the next step, if you like, which is mindfulness leading to pro-social behaviors themselves. Um, there's a few ways you can approach that topic. I mean, partly, if you, um, to the extent you uh, believe that mindfulness does cultivate capacities like empathy, there's a whole literature around then uh, how empathy is thought to um, have a, a number of um, uh, pro-social uh, implications in terms of behaviors. Um, there's more directly uh, qualitative feedback from um, individuals who practice mindfulness uh, training programs who so often for instance, in the context of mindfulness-based cognitive therapy and various others, have so often reported really positive changes in their personal relationships. Now, to approach this issue of uh, mindfulness and pro-social behavior um, more scientifically, 
there is some literature there. It's at a more, um, I guess, nascent uh, stage, I think. And I think there's a question for us to reflect on personally, which is how much one would seek or expect to find a concrete mapping between mindfulness practice and what's going on there and measured pro-social behaviors in that direct fashion. But certainly there are interesting um, findings in, in the research that is there in this area, uh, linking mindfulness practice to reducing implicit bias, uh, implicit racial bias, um, linking individuals higher in trait mindfulness to more environmentally responsible behaviors. Um, and one study finding that participants who just completed a mindfulness training course were more than three times, sorry, three times more likely than a control group um, to offer help to someone in need. So again, you know, this research, we need to um, do more, I think, well, more needs to be done and, and, and addressing some of the really tricky methodological issues in that area. But some of those uh, findings, I think, at least give credence to the other points, I think the more important points that I've discussed, and it looks quite promising. So a few words to sum up. I think that, I think there were really good reasons um, to believe that by paying attention on purpose, by allowing space to connect with one's deeper intentions, by widening our perspective, that mindfulness can support us to make wiser choices and respond to challenges that we face as individuals and as societies, and that there are pro-social implications if we think mindfulness can help us become less reactive, less impulsive, but more attentive, uh, more curious, and you know, able to accept at least other viewpoints as being there and to disagree better, to find common ground through our direct and embodied experience of life as it is moment to moment. So because of all of that, for policymakers and thought leaders and so on, broadly outside of the mindfulness um, kind of community, reflecting on how to build the kind of society we all want to live in, I think Absolutely, we should consider the specific applications of mindfulness for certain populations and their specific needs completely. But in addition, there might be um, a space there to think a little bit more holistically around mindfulness as this foundational capacity. And there are hints of that, um, you know, kind of awareness bubbling up. So one MP, John Crudders, has noted that mindfulness increasingly seems to be an area that more and more people are turning to as a whole approach to public policy making. And Tessa mentioned, uh, you know, my former uh, life as uh, an economist at the Bank of England, public sector economics, and, and, and I'm reminded there um, for this demand for more holistic and, and integrated um, approaches to policy making, to a speech that the governor, Mark Carney, made a few years ago on ethics and finance, where he notes humans' tendencies to compartmentalize things. You could probably say that's economists' tendencies in particular, but I think the point he's making is that as humans, we do compartmentalize things, and there's a real danger of taking that to extremes. So he, he says that we can divide up our lives into different realms, each with its own set of rules, where home is distinct from work, where ethics is distinct from the law, and where the individual is distinct from the system. And such a reductionist view of the human condition, he argues, will serve as a really poor foundation for long-term human prosperity. And so to rebuild that foundation, we really need to avoid this excessive compartmentalization of our lives. And I think in that context, mindfulness um, and seeing mindfulness more than just, from a policy context, more than just the sum of its specific applications is really relevant here to to help us integrate different spheres of our lives, mind and body, self and other, and you know, look across different policy domains in, in public policy to, um, towards a more integrated vision of the whole. And I mentioned in my introduction the relevance of thinking about mindfulness in this more foundational way in the context of um, you know, really big global challenges that we're facing in coming decades. And one of those is um, around technology. And, um, and on this, in, in his recent book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, 
the historian Yuval Noah Harari discusses some of the risks for society if we don't balance advances in um, artificial intelligence and technology um, with advances in our humanity. And he, he warns you know, of, a, of a dystopia in which downgraded humans misuse upgraded computers to wreak havoc upon themselves and the world. <laughs> um, which is interesting, but it's his advice on how to respond to this situation, which I think is especially pertinent here, because he says that for every dollar and every minute we invest in improving artificial intelligence, it would be wise to invest a dollar and a minute investing in advancing human consciousness. So I wonder whether investing, if you like, in mindfulness and the capacities of heart and mind, which it in turn can help us to foster, could form a central part of an overall vision for a flourishing society. Whether political leaders and others engaged in commenting on you know, these big picture questions about our future should consider with you know, putting greater attention and resources into mindfulness as a basic and perhaps even essential component of societal flourishing. But while these questions of, so what should we do and what should leaders do are of course absolutely important, um, for the work that we've been doing on this particular piece and, and what I've been talking about today, um, the main point is just seeing in a policy context mindfulness as a foundational capacity is in itself an important step on this journey. And I think ultimately that comes down to the issue of really recognizing fully what the uh, possibilities afforded to us through mindfulness can be, what mindfulness is in that broader sense. And so I'll end with a quote that I heard uh, recently on a podcast. It was Oprah Winfrey interviewing um, John Kabat-Zinn and pushing him exactly on, but what is, how shall I think of this thing you're saying, mindfulness? And he responded that it's a gateway to the full dimensionality of being human. So I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dan and Jamie. So we could have some time now for uh, comments and questions. And we've got uh, students uh, helping us with mics that can go around the room. So if you'd just like to raise your hand when you've got uh, a question or a comment, and they'll come with the microphones. Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much. You mentioned the, the problem of our acting like automatons uh, and or on autopilot. Uh, but of course, an essential as a human being is to form good habits. And habits are also, there. we acquire them by doing things repetitively and unthinkingly. How do we distinguish? How can we, dist because in the end, things like smartphones are just a new bit of technology about which we are for, with which we are forming new habits. Yeah. So how do we separate out good habits, useful habits which are essential to survive because we can't think about every single thing that we do every day uh, and the danger of acting on autopilot? I'm happy to say. Um, uh, no, you've got something to say, please, please. Um, I mean, yeah, it would be totally exhausting if we didn't have a cerebellum or you know uh, mechanisms in the brain to uh, to, to automate things, um, and uh, uh, we need a tremendous amount of willpower every day just just to keep ourselves doing things that keep us alive and, and clean and <laughs> um, and, and and going through the world. I think though um, that you can uh, be aware of what you're doing when you're doing it, uh, even when it is a, a, a habitual thing. Um, and have the have, have the choice to um, to, to do that. Uh, so, um, uh, the, the, having that having that awareness that you are in a habit routine um, doesn't stop you um, doesn't stop it being a habit and taking much less energy um, and and sort of uh, concentration to be able to do it. So I, I, I can I can I can sort of. Um, 
have mindfulness while I'm tying my shoes, have mindfulness while I'm doing my teeth. And if I want to, I can then also think about other things, staying tethered in the present moment, but going into abstraction and, 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 and planning uh, and having creative um, leaps. But there's, there's, there's some element through the training of um, mindfulness as a habit, as a, as a, as a tendency, for you to, for you to not uh, get lost um, when those habits veer into um, uh, unhealthy territory or when, you're, when your thoughts get kind of ruminative and repetitive. There's, there's a kind of, you're, you're, yeah, you're, you're able to go through life with some habits, um, lapse into abstraction, but still have some kind of tethered, tethered to the present moment, so there's an element of choice there. And that's why I say, actually, a mindfulness teacher um, would probably do a better job of saying that. But, yeah. Did you want anything to add there? That's, that's yeah. <laughs> Um, you spoke quite a lot about how mindfulness can benefit those in positions of power, you know, cultivating empathy and helping them to disagree better. How would mindfulness be of benefit to those who are powerless? <laughs> so there are, um, it's a really very, very good question, very important question. And there are, there are innovators in, in the mindfulness training world that are um, most interested in uh, creating types of training that are sort of uh, culturally accessible um, for those in the most disadvantaged sections of society. Um, and to, um, uh, and to, yeah, to, be, to, to be tailored um, for those lives. And, and I, I see actually the role of, of, of public policy um, potentially to, to help, um, help those uh, uh, communities access mindfulness training um, who can't afford it. So it's, it's, it's finding its way into boardrooms and yoga centers and places you might expect. Um, but there are still places where they're kind of high and dry and, and haven't, haven't heard of the, the word before. So um, John Credis, as uh, MP, as, as, as Dan mentioned, thought that mindfulness might be particularly helpful. Um, and, and the way that he described for, for these kind of communities, and the way that he described it is he, he, um, he's an MP for an area that has a lot of social deprivation. Um, he, I think it's something like two or three thousand cases a month come and come into his surgery, asking for help, for emailing him, coming in, having having interviews, um, and, and what he said was that there's behind a lot of these sort of quite complex and, and seemingly intractable problems. He said there's kind of a, often a drumbeat of of poor mental health issues, um, and rather than wanting to sort of individualise um, it and say we just need to sort of get those people to sort their own individual. Um, uh, health out. Um, he's sort of recognising that at, 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 the, at the core of a lot of the issues that that, that, that keep these uh, um, these communities deprived, um, mental health is part of the picture as well as the systemic stuff. And so, just by improving mental health and self-regulation, people may be may be more able um, to to um, uh, yeah interact better, interact better and make make um, make make positive changes but he more than you know more than um, more than many are, are very aware of the systemic picture as well that that fits into um, and uh, uh, and but, but I think it's a really important piece to look at um, uh, yeah mental health and uh, intergenerational trauma and, and and basically include more psychology in our in our models for for social change and for policy making because um, often it's it's just completely absent thanks very much for your talk um, it, it made me reflect on somebody who was a zen practitioner that i used to meditate with who died about 20 years ago and because of his childhood experiences, he dedicated his life to trying to foster compassion in society. Um, he worked in the mental health sector. And every time he came across a situation that he felt um, represented injustice, prejudice, hypocrisy, stigma, he would directly confront very, very forcefully the policymakers involved. And as a result of that, he was sacked from a lot of his jobs. But through his actions, he did bring about a lot of change by shocking those people into thinking about what they were doing. Um, and as a result of his work, it did make significant changes in the mental health sector. But I guess his approach was very different in some ways to what you're, you're referring to in terms of 
a sort of an understanding of the other perspective, but possibly a more passive approach. Um, and I just wondered uh, your reflections on, on those two different types of approaches to, to policy making and policy change. Yeah, happy to say, but I think that's absolutely touching on um, a really uh, perennial issue actually to do with um, openness and maybe receptivity to one's environment, including in that others' perspectives, others' value systems, which, uh, you know, um, which may not fit with one's own. And, and, and that, on the one hand, with uh, seeing clarity to act and uh, also uh, drawing on courage um, to act and to speak up. And like I said, if, if, you, um, if you do connect with what you care about, with your values, and have clarity on the situation, um, I think it's ultimately helpful to, um, to listen to others' views before jumping into action, but at the same time when you feel moved to act, to do so um, in a way which I think, uh, you know, there's, there's ways of disagreeing, and, and I don't know, you know, the, you know, the specifics there, um, but I guess I think in the way that uh, discourse takes place at the moment, you could argue that, um, you know, the entrenched polarization and division in and of itself isn't helpful to the system or to any to, to society as a whole. And in that context, it is not to say um, accept others' views as fine and don't act, but it's um, acceptance of what people feel and are saying as the starting point to seek to move towards, uh, as a starting point for action rather than reacting against it. But, you know, it's, it's, it's always, I think, a very um, complex thing to disentangle those two. Mm. Uh, I think there are many different roles in, in sort of change and resistance um, uh, in, in society, and we need people doing those different roles. You know, I've got a friend who's currently on an action in Preston trying to shut down a coal field, um, and I, I, I feel like we're, we're doing similar work, just in very, very different ways. <laughs> You know, we, ha we have to be really neutral and even-handed and diplomatic when we're talking about the different ways that politicians are applying mindfulness and starting to improve the way they see it, political discourse. Um, and it, but it's not appropriate for me to try to shut down coal plants because I'd have my parliamentary pass revoked. Um, so so we, we've got to kind of, like, all of us have got to be different sort of petals of the flower opening at once in, in, in some ways, at least that's, that's the, way I, the way I see it. And some, sometimes I think you can get sort of insights from from personal practice and the kind of injunctions and teaching um, uh, statements or, or encouragements that, that you get on an individual level and how that might apply um, relationally. And, and one of, the, one, one of our, our colleagues um, talks about the, um, the instruction in a mindfulness practice to be sort of firm or strong in the back and soft in the front. And we're trying to balance these things the receptivity and the sort of relaxation element, but also the aliveness and the awakeness and the, and the strength and the rigor that requires you often to pay attention to things that are quite difficult. And there's a tendency to go to sleep or shrink away from or, you know. So it isn't just about being all soft and nice. There's, there is also actually a sense of kind of, you know, a bit of, a bit of power there as well. Um, and uh, uh, so, yes, I think there are ways, the ways of going about change that, that try and find the right balance between those things. One more question. Hi. Um, my question is, I guess, would it be enough? As in, it's one thing to, say, bring greater awareness to a population, um, have them being in touch with um, their true selves in the moment, um, and that all sounds great. But what happens then? So it's like somebody might recognize their neurotic um, or a neurosis, but if they're not getting help with dealing with that, um, where does that go on a wider scale? Mm. Mm. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of ways to approach that, but um, one, of the sim one of the simple ways to talk about particularly um, uh, uncovering uh, mental health issues which is, which is a, um, a possibility, points to uh, mindfulness teachers needing high quality training. So they recognize those signs, they know where to signpost people, they can hold people through difficult experiences. 
we all have ways of adapting to difficulty and some adaptions, adaptations, uh, defense mechanisms include repression and, and some people don't want to stop still because actually stopping still is quite difficult for them. And when you do encourage them to do so, uh, actually anxiety can feel worse and there can be like a lot of energy in the system. And, and uh, uh, we're talking about here mindfulness as um, a, a capacity of mind and talking about it, it at that, that level we think is theoretically good for a lot more of that in society. It's different from the question of how do, is it best to cultivate it and, and for whom and at what point and in what intensity. And that question is a matter for innovation and, and research and science. And there's just, you know, there's what is it, two or three papers coming out a day on mindfulness, but it's still a very early field and a lot of that is sort of small sample sizes and a lot more work is, is needed. Um, uh, and, that, and that question of, of, uh, of how do we hold people through difficult, difficult experiences and what are the right signposts and, and what's the right level of teacher training is, is a really live one, um, particularly, say, in the workplace. But, uh, thank you. So, thank you thank very you. much to Jamie and Jamie.